So just want to welcome folks into the room here. Uh, it's going to go see if folks could in, uh, indicate where you're from uh, by renaming yourself. That'd be great. I'll do the same myself if you don't know how to. Uh, just do the uh, click the three little buttons in the upper right corner and indicate where you're from state wise. So I'm going to put PA OPS rename. That way we know where folks are from a little bit, get oriented. Um, let's see. Uh, thanks, Sherry. Uh, thanks, Brenda. Uh, Wes, Alan, Doug. Uh, Phil's with us. Thanks, Phil, uh, from the Nurses uh, Union. Uh, Diana, boss, if you could rename, that'd be great. Thank you so much. Um, and even the presenters, Bevan, if you could just indicate, you know, just for folks uh, also that you're watching. There you go. Perfect. Uh, Sherry, Jen, uh, somebody from Illinois, if you could identify yourself, that'd be helpful, uh, renaming yourself if you could. Somebody identified from New Jersey also, uh, Walter's with us, Zipporah, uh, Pastor Fred, welcome. Uh, again, if you could rename yourself, just give us uh, the state where you're from, that'd be wonderful. Uh, who else is with us? Corey from Bloomington, Illinois, terrific. Uh, and again, the folks from Illinois, who identify as Illinois and New Jersey, if you could just rename yourself, that'd be wonderful. Thank you so, so much. So let me uh, uh, call the meeting to order here uh, by saying that um, my name's Chuck Pinocchio. Am I on screen here? Let's see, yep. Uh, and I'm actually taking uh, a part, part here from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, Sharpsburg to be specific. It's a nice little working class town. Or for the, those of you I haven't com communicated with in a while, I moved here early this year. Um, I'm the president of One Payer States. We are a 20 state consortium of organizations that are working at the, we work at the local level, we work at the state level, we work at the regional level increasingly, and we also work at the national level in pursuit of the gold standard. Everybody in this room wants national healthcare for all, guaranteed comprehensive quality healthcare for all at the national level. That's what we aspire to. Uh, we're the only organization of our kind in that we are focused uh, primarily at the state level, but whenever there's action activity at the national level, we jump in. We are brothers and sisters all pulling in the same direction, aspiring to the same effort, uh, which is to get us to join the civilized world. Uh, I, I would, I'm just going to say here real quick that, you know, you know, you're making progress when you're trolled by the Galen Institute, the Galen Institute, which I just read their email from earlier in the week, referred to last Tuesday's Medicare for All hearing as a wildly unrealistic picture of the utopia of a single government controlled healthcare system. Yeah, utopia, right? It's a system in variation that's, that's engaged by every other civilized nation in the entire world, providing healthcare for all of its citizens. So. We are making progress when you get that kind of trolling. And we are here today to share the story of what's happening specifically in the states of Washington and Oregon. Um, and it's very exciting what's happening in the Northwest. So there's great news in the great Northwest and really thrilled to bring in uh, three presenters from each of these states. Uh, we have uh, Chris Curry, who's gonna be coming up first. Uh, Chris is gonna talk about the history and legacy excuse me, the legislative context up to 2018 in the state of Washington. Also add a few comments about ERISA, the Employee Retirement Income Security Act. Uh, we'll be followed by Bevan McLeod. Bevan is gonna to speak to the political rise in Washington of first their healthcare task force, and then more recently, uh, the establishment of a permanent healthcare commission whose charge it is to, is to create a, again, a universal, comprehensive healthcare system, quality healthcare system for all Washingtonians. And then third, we've got uh, Kelly uh, is gonna be coming up uh, to speak, Kelly Powers coming up to speak about the nuts and bolts of how the, health, the healthcare commission is operating. And also to give some tips on how to do some organizing and bring yourselves together as a, as a broad-based coalition. Uh, next, we're gonna turn over to Oregon and we'll be uh, 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 presented with uh, comments by uh, Tom Sinsick, the president of Healthcare for All Oregon. Tom will pro provide a large picture context of how Oregon has gotten where they are today and the excitement that is, that is uh, 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 surrounding this campaign just to the south of Washington state. Next up uh, will be Zainab Aladina. Uh, Zainab is going to provide discussion 
on the task, for, task force report, uh, the HOPE amendment, and the next legislative steps that are gonna be necessary to get Oregon over the, over the uh, finish line to create their own uh, universal healthcare system. And then finally, we'll have Charlie Swanson. Charlie will be speaking to the synergy of state and regional and national efforts, uh, all in support. We And also he'll be speaking to the state-based universal healthcare legislation. This is really our fundamental action step today. We want folks to pile on with Ro Khanna's uh, state-based universal healthcare act. We'll drop uh, links in the box regarding that. Charlie also will be speaking to Arissa to complement Chris's comments. And he'll be talking about the task force on universal healthcare in Oregon. So those are our, our six presenters. And I'll do their bios as they come up one by one uh, and make the transition from uh, speaker to speaker. So uh, without any further ado, I just wanna again, welcome those who just came into the meeting. Uh, my name is Chuck Pinocchio, president of One Pair States. Uh, we are hosting, delighted to host this conversation, discussion uh, between and among uh, leaders, healthcare justice leaders in Washington state and Oregon. And so without any further ado, let me bring up Chris Curry. You can begin screen sharing, Chris, if you would. And I'll introduce you first. So Chris Curry is uh, a retired RN from Spokane, Washington, and has been uh, a longtime volunteer for Healthcare for All Washington, working to promote Medicare for All uh, at the uh, state-based single-payer system. Uh, Chris's primary contribution has been writing and continually updating an interactive interactive ebook called a Medicare for All Q and A, and I'll drop that link into the box uh, so folks can take advantage of this work that has application across the board, whether we're talking state, regional, or national. Chris Curry, thanks so much, Chris. Thanks, Chuck. Um, for our plenary presentation on Thursday, I reviewed Washington's history of progressive healthcare reform as well as a strategy for obtaining federal waivers and avoiding the ERISA preemption. If you missed that, I would encourage you to go back and view it for more detail. Uh, but for now, I'm just going to hit my main points. Washington enacted the first state subsidized health insurance plan in the nation called the Basic Health Plan way back in 1987. In 1993, the Health Services Act was passed but subsequently scuttled by the incoming Republican administration. However, the, the basic health plan survived and the whole statute became the basis for Romney Care in Massachusetts, which in turn became the basis for the Affordable Care Act. So these state efforts were incredibly important for passage of that massive federal legislation. Our single payer bill called the Washington Health Security Trust, uh, pronounced WUST, was first introduced in 2011 by Healthcare for All Washington. It was then reintroduced four times without success. So we switched tactics in 2019, hired a skilled lobbyist and proceeded down the path we are now on to our work group and commission. But numerous other bills were passed in the last two or three years that will become important parts of the single payer system, including ones to require more transparency and hospital expense reporting, along with a board which will analyze that data. Legislation passed to allow the state to produce and distribute generic drugs, plus bills to create health equity zones create a prescription drug affordability board, create a cap on insulin prices, protect consumers from surprise billing, extend Medicaid pregnancy coverage, and measure and increase expenditures on primary care. And we most recently received the go ahead for a Medicaid parity project for undocumented immigrants. My conclusion is that one or two successful state-based single-payer programs will dramatically increase the chances that a Medicare for All single-payer system will be adopted nationally. 
Some people claim that these efforts are sapping energy away from the national movement, but they are actually making the national movement much more viable because it's just simply too risky for the feds to implement what is arguably the most complex social initiative this country has ever attempted without having some initial successful experiments done by a state or two, such as were done with the Affordable Care Act. It is also much easier to mobilize and organize volunteers for local state projects than it is for strictly national efforts. But patience is certainly needed because it's going to take a couple more years before the first state breaks through the log jam. But we think Washington, with its long history of progressive health care reform, stands a very good chance of being there among the first. Thanks. Terrific, Chris. Hey, thank you so, so much. Um, I also just want to call folks' attention. If you have questions, if you would kindly drop them in the chat, that would be wonderful. And um, so next up, our, our next speaker up is uh, Bevan McLeod. And Bevan is co-author of Washington State's Permanent Universal Healthcare Commission. Uh, Bevan's background spans an array of projects um, in healthcare policy reform. Uh, one of her key uh, 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 contributions here has been to bring together all these disparate organizations under the umbrella of Alliance for Healthy Washington, where Bevan helps to streamline the advocacy works of, of these numerous stakeholders, helps to break down barriers of access, uh, promotes communication, education to influence meaningful change in healthcare policy. And uh, Bevan will go on to discuss uh, the Washington uh, Healthcare Task Force, as well as the Universal Permanent, I should say, Universal Healthcare uh, Commission. So thanks so much, Bevan. Thank you. And welcome to all those who, who have joined the call since getting on. Thank you. Thank you, Chuck, um, and and thank you to everybody. I hope that you had an opportunity to watch the the pre-recorded plenary. Um, so, I, uh, just like Chris, I'm going to go through this uh, more quickly than I did in the plenary. Um, but essentially, Alliance for Healthy Washington is a 501c4. Um, collectively, we have organizations um, that represent uh, over 215,000 Washington State residents who are members of Alliance for Healthy Washington. And really the impetus was to say, we're not gonna outraise the status quo, but we can outpolitic them. And uh, if we can really coalesce around an advocacy, um, then we can make movement happen at the state level. And I think as has happened in, in many issues in this country's history, uh, states are often the incubators for systemic change. So hoping that Washington, Oregon, and other states can be uh, banner carriers for systemic change in, in, in healthcare reform in, Washington, in our country. Um, so really just wanted to talk through timeline and strategy. Uh, as Chris articulated in the, in the 2000s and into the mid 2000s, the Washington Health Security Trust was reintroduced several times. And uh, in 2018, uh, the, the, the chair of the healthcare committee finally said, okay, we'll give it a uh, post-session hearing. And we were able to really sit in front of the uh, committee and talk through the different pieces of the Washington Health Security Trust. And I think that really started to change the trajectory for Washington State and how we were able to convince members of uh, that committee that, that things were moving. And things were moving at the national level with um, Pramila Jayapal's State-Based Universal Healthcare Act being reintroduced in 2018. And so from there, we were able to get the uh, Washington State Institute for Public Policy to do research on uh, single payer systems around the, the world that were about the size and population of Washington State. And from there, able to uh, develop the uh, Pathway to Universal Healthcare Workgroup. And I think really in 2017, 2018, what mattered and what changed was that we as advocates were able to listen to legislators who were saying, hey, look, we really support getting to universal healthcare, but we don't see a strategy in passing the whole kit and caboodle in one go. We need you to figure out, sit down and tell us how do we break this into steps so the legislature can do that. And so this was our answer to that. So in 2020, uh, Kelly and I and, and 37, well, 35 other members sat through the uh, 
the pathway to universal healthcare work group through the pandemic, and we met every month and really dived into what the economic analysis would look like for three different models, which I know Kelly will go into more, and you know, really brought all of the, the disparate stakeholders to the table so that nobody could say they weren't invited to the conversation. And what came out of that was recommendations from the work group um, to talk to say, let's stand up a commission to finish the work. So that's what we did. Uh, my, my colleague, Nicole Gomez, and I sat down and drafted um, the uh, Universal Healthcare Commission um, and got legislative champions and were able to introduce that into the 2021 legislative session. I think, you know, I was just talking with a young woman this morning. She asked, well, what was what made it change? And I think, yes, having uh, having to go through a global pandemic was one of the pieces. We were all living through a public health crisis. And so we could point to that and say, hey, look, what we have right now is simply not sustainable and more people were feeling that. Mm -hmm. But I think also, you know, laying the foundation to say we as advocates have been listening and we understand that even though we think it might be simplistic from the outside to pass an $11 billion single payer bill, uh, from the inside, if you're trying to make that happen as a legislator, that can be really tricky. Uh, that's a lot of money for a state legislature like Washington State. So, you know, really trying to kind of build the political bridge, if you will, on the outside and the inside. So really finding your legislative champions, which we did um, oh, since, you know, starting in 2017 up to now, and making sure that they had the support that they needed uh, from the public to be able to step forward in their caucuses and rally and actually advocate themselves for these bills. And so from my perspective, it's kind of like running a statewide initiative campaign, except that the initiative is a bill. So you need the earned media, you need the grassroots support, the folks who are going to show up and write an op-ed or, you know, come testify at the hearing and really building that capacity on the outside so that you can also support the people on the inside who are willing to uh, step out and say, okay, I'll be a champion for this. Also winning the support of the chairs is key. And I think, you know, Representative Eileen Cody, who's the house that has been the chair of the House Healthcare Committee for close to two decades, um, really, I think, needed to see that change from reintroducing the Washington Health Security Trust in, in its basically same form over and over again, wanted to see advocates come to the table and break it up a little bit. And so that convinced her over a couple of different sessions um, to say, okay, I think we can do this. And I think the time has changed at the national level, at the state level. And uh, she, I think was finally won over and helped make our permanent universal healthcare commission um, the strongest it could possibly be. So I just wanna point out that by winning her support and um, spending that time to, to gain some trust with her, um, she was able to help change it to make it a permanent commission. Um, she decided to amend it to say, no, the commission doesn't need two years to synthesize the analyses that have already been done, but they can do it in one year. And so change the due date for the first report to November 1st. Um, and also she strengthened it by putting a clause in the very last page that empowers state agencies that have statutory authority to implement any and all components of any of the reports that the commission puts forward. So that's really, really strong stuff. Um, if you think about uh, the, healthcare, uh, the healthcare authority, uh, the office of the insurance commissioner, the department of health, et cetera, they all have statutory authority to make rules through the rulemaking process rather than having to go through the legislature. So that makes this, um, at least in Dr. Shao's opinion, um, the strongest uh, universal health care bill that has passed in over a decade. Um, and of course, I'm always happy to answer questions in, on that. And I know we're limited on time. So just want to talk about looking forward. Really, from my perspective, the political will forward is like, hey, we just got through the primary, right? <laughs> now we have to get through the general and make sure that we, that we get this system across the finish line, which means uh, implementing the commission's recommendations. So again, that grassroots support, the, the political organizing to make sure that the commission's members, that the members of the legislature know that the recommendations are coming forward and making sure that that's presented. Um, making sure that we're supporting legislative candidates who support universal health care. 
um, and making sure that they get into office. Uh, that's huge. Getting the federal waivers, I think, you know, Chris went into more detail in the plenary, but that matters to a state like Washington where we're very limited in generating progressive revenue. Um, public engagement and testimony, and of course, earned media. So those are all really key pieces to getting things across the finish line. Um, and I look forward to the Q&A. That's always the part where I think people learn the most. I know it's where I learn the most. And please feel free to reach out to me at Alliance for Healthy Washington for more. And I will pass it, I think, back to you, Chuck, right, for Kelly? Yeah, yeah. Hey, terrific, Bevan. Thanks so much. Appreciate that. A lot of substance there, um, as was Chris's presentation. Uh, we're starting to get a flow of questions into the chat. Appreciate that, Wes, Jonathan. Um, also just wanted to um, uh, 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 extend kudos to Mike Huntington, who has been is handling the levers today for us, uh, our engineer and secretary over at One Pair of States. Thanks so much, Mike, for your work. Kelly uh, Powers is our next presenter. And Kelly um, came into the uh, uh, prominence here uh, with the uh, associated with problems with the ACA, the, the premiums, spiraling costs, uh, cost sharing issues. Uh, and Kelly, as such, was appointed consumer representative to the Washington Universal Healthcare Commission work group that Bevan talked about as a precursor to the Universal Healthcare Commission. Uh, she helped to form the Healthcare as a Human Right Washington Coalition, huge uh, coalition, in order to um, uh, advance the principles of uh, universal healthcare. Uh, Kelly will be discussing the inner workings of Washington State's Permanent Universal Healthcare Commission as it moves closer to establishing what may become the first in the nation Medicare for all state model. Kelly, thanks so much. Thank you, Chuck. I'm going to talk about the nuts and bolts and how we're working with the commission. And uh, I might have a little bit duplicate information, so I might move through some slides really fast like this one, because we've been saying all along that we're all working, including Oregon, on multiple simultaneous paths to our ultimate goal, Medicaid for all, Medicare for all. And uh, Bevan brought up the different points of the, the, how the, our commission was designed for success. And I think I drilled down on that too in the plenary. So I think I'm gonna move on from that slide. And one thing though I did wanna point out is that um, I'm, make sure if you have a commission or a task force or a work group that it has a crystal clear deliverable. And here's the one that our Washington State Universal Healthcare Commission has to establish a preliminary infrastructure to create a universal healthcare system, including a unified financing system. And that is just really great because we can always drive them back to that as the main, their, the commission's main agenda. <clears throat> Now I wanna to pivot to the work of our coalition. And um, we see ourselves as working to make universal healthcare inevitable. And we, um, we see ourselves as providing stewardship for this commission, helping the commission to act urgently to deliver a solid plan for universal healthcare. Now, the permanent nature of the commission is fantastic, but it's also a little bit of a cover to kind of go slowly sometimes. So that means that we have to inject some urgency in the process along the way. And I'm just pointing that out in case you have to do that too with your work group or commission. Um, we also are always striving to build even broader support for universal health care. And we're advocating for solutions to policy and political roadblocks that we encounter through this process. Um, wanted to let you know the work group, I won't, I didn't plan on talking about all the three different plans that came out of the work group, but the one that did that we support uh, offers coverage designed and administered by the state, care delivered as now by private and public healthcare providers, clinics and hospitals. And all Washingtonians are covered by the state plan, existing federal or tribal program. And the plan really tackles equity, affordability, cost control, and underinsurance. And the great news is that according to the financial analysts hired by the state themselves, so not, not us, um, it would save the state 1.5 it would save uh, 1.56 billion in total public and private healthcare spending in the first year and 5.5 billion thereafter. I'm gonna move some screens, some of my screens because I can't read my, <laughs> my slide all the way. There we go. <clears throat> um, 
then we also wanted to share some other elements that we see as being critical for building towards inevitability with our commission. Um, and I think this is a mantra throughout the conference, everything I've heard so far, health equity, um, keeping short-term profit-driven companies in the system, which make money by denying care is inherently inequitable, more costly and unsustainable. So we're always trying to limit that, that uh, the short-term profit-driven companies. And we're taking great care to partner with labor so that we address their concerns and the needs of healthcare workers as we go along. And of course, grassroots support and visibility is super important. So um, we, I, we want to give you some tips and I put them in three buckets, um, people, policy, and meetings. And uh, what I want to say here is that it's really important to dedicate a group to focus just on the commission. There's so many issues that are, you know, we're working through Medicare for all, ACO reach, build back better. But it really does take just a dedicated group of people meeting regularly to keep your eye on the ball with your commission or your work group. Also wanna say that we, we have 60 plus organizations and individuals across the state in the healthcare uh, is a human right Washington uh, coalition, but we are always looking for ways to divvy up and share the work. Uh, for example, one of our groups uh, offers a fantastic monthly speaker series. Other groups are more policy wonks. So we're working together, coordinating, divvying up that work, and it allows us to shine the light on our allies and protect our the energy of our advocates. So, um, and also we've really been learning lately, especially that we need to go beyond the commission. Um, and so we're identifying our natural allies and nurturing relationships with legislators, state agency staff, healthcare boards, labor, federally qualified healthcare um, <clears throat> clinics, Planned Parenthood, et cetera. So we're always working behind the scenes to learn the sticking points, working through the issues, developing and building support for our solutions and goals. <clears throat> um, it's really important to make good use of existing policy and work that's already been done by yourself or by other groups or by the legislature itself. Um, we are, we work hard, we have a whole policy committee dedicated to pushing current initiatives in the legislature and state agencies to set up universal health care in our state. And for example, this year we worked on immigrant health care, public health, strengthening primary care, fortifying healthcare workers, controlling healthcare costs and more. And I sit on that policy committee and I'm always pushing um, them to consider to filter all the bills through this filter. Will it advance universal healthcare? And if not, how could this bill do that? Mm -hmm. So that's another way we coordinate and work together to make universal healthcare happen. Okay, um, let's see, meetings, commission meetings. Oops, let me go back one. Um, we make you good use of public testimony, generally pushing the urgency of the work and bringing forward people with an array of lived experiences and expertise. And also I just pro tip, that is a great way to build your coalition because you can ask people who aren't, aren't currently a part of your commission to um, participate and then you start building relationships with more organizations. Uh, respond to and suggest agenda items. Uh, usually that can happen, you know, with an email, but sometimes if you're just not getting traction, you may have to make some noise at the meetings during the public testimony. Uh, also very important is to pay attention to the process. So voting procedures, timing of the public testimony, reviewing the schedule of the draft reports, getting timely meeting materials, all those are those little things that it's, you know, as they say, the politest way to scuttle proposals is to control the process. So you have to insist on good governance. Um, and always allow your base to help back up your work. You know, call on them if you need to, to make some noise and support your efforts uh, with the commission and whoever else you need to get support from. So, um, to wrap it up, it's all coming together in Washington and I suspect Oregon too. Um, the strong bill that we have forming the commission, the commission members, existing bills and policies, the potential of multi-state coordination, our strong coalition, 
state leaders are on our side. So we're looking forward to learning more about Oregon and um, having further conversation. Thanks. Thanks so much, Kelly. Appreciate it. Um, uh, again, a lot of substance and always to remind people to save the chat so you have that information. I've dropped a number of links into the chat just to keep folks uh, supporting the work that we're doing here and getting the, the uh, state-based universal health care legislation supported as well as one pair states. Uh, next up, we're going to pivot to the, the mm -hmm. Oregon uh, and, and our next speaker is Tom Sensick. Uh, Tom is uh, uh, amazing leader of Healthcare for All Oregon, uh, has headed up the organization since 2017. Tom, on background, has a master's of science in nursing and community health nursing from Yale University. Uh, Tom was a family nurse practitioner for 26 years, where he served and learned from diverse communities in rural East Tennessee, for the Saginaw Chippewa Tribe in Michigan, and corrections health with students of every background in school-based health clinics. Uh, these experiences inspired Tom to become a leading advocate of healthcare as a human right through a single pair universal healthcare system. Tom Sensick, welcome. Uh, you thank you very much. I think I have a technical problem, so I'm gonna have to work around this. I practiced a recording. It seems to have slid into my presentation, so I don't want that. So I'm just gonna go through the slides like this. If this is okay, it should work out. If people can see my screen. Um, okay. So uh, again, thank you, uh, Washington. Well, I wanna say ditto to uh, what you've laid out for us, right? A lot of this is the same things going on here in the state of Oregon. I am Tom Sensick. I'm accompanied by Charlie Swanson from HCO Action and uh, Zainab Aladina, our HCO Legislative Chair. Uh, we wanna know how is Oregon getting there? I'm gonna take a little different look at an overview that like Chuck said about how we're getting there. Okay, next slide. Let me go next. Sorry about this problem, folks. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and see if I can start the slideshow. Okay, how do I? Okay. Mm. Um, if you um, turn off your own speaker for a while, you won't hear it. Turn off my own speaker. Let's see. Here. Like your, your sound, if you turn off your sound, you won't hear it as you play it. Oh, I see. Will you hear it? We can't hear How's it anymore, that? so that's good. Uh, okay, let's see here. Sorry, folks. Turn off my own speaker. Tom, now I think you're mute though. Okay, sorry everyone. Zainab, can you go ahead and do this? Play the screens, we'll do it that way. I'll sure. stop sharing. Okay, go ahead. Okay, I think we're ready to go. Thank you very much. How are we getting there in Oregon? Uh, basically, we've got a road ahead. There may be several paths we're gonna take, but we're not sure which one, right? So we have to be remain flexible the whole time. And it was said earlier, sometimes we have to do things behind the scenes. We're not gonna be telling everybody all of our strategy as we go forward. Sometimes you have to do things behind the scenes as you go forward. Next slide. Okay, so one of the things we did was identify a bunch of obstacles uh, and, and themes going forward, right? So what ingredients do we need to be successful? We kind of looked at that to go forward. We do have a strategic plan uh, built around some specific goals, but a lot of this is kind of comes from the internal work, belief, hope, and persistence. That is, even if you have a big strategy, if you don't have belief, hope, and persistence, you might have problems. Next slide. Okay, one of the things we did, we took lessons learned from other states. 
what, and from ourselves and here in Oregon. Insurers at the table have historically caused some problems here in Oregon and other states. So we decided in creating the task force on universal health care here that the insurers would not be a part at this stage of the game. And we think that's helped. We heard from Washington about the need for a wider community in the process. We're making sure that that happens. The next thing is uh, legislative obstruction can happen at any time. Things like um, public option, things like that, that we have to work around. And identifying, as it was identified earlier, a legislative champion. We have several, but I want to name Senator James Manning as the person that says, this is my issue and we're going to get this done. Uh, talking about the issue of attitude is really important, that we need that cohesive effort, cohesion among the group to tie ourselves together and working forward in a common direction to be as powerful as we can. And of course, there's always the unknown that's going to show up. And we're going to uh, address those in a flexible manner as they come forward. Next. We've got a pathway forward to universal health care. There's the door at the top. Uh, take a note as we go up these steps, and you're going to hear from uh, Zainab and Charlie, um, that community engagement is essential at every step of the way. You can never leave community out. And that's what we're going to be focused on as an organization, and that's what the task force is focusing on. They're doing uh, already done some focus groups. There's a great report that's just come out, and also they're going to be regional hearings to the task force where they're going to have these listening sessions to hear what do people want. Next slide. Okay, belief as a foundation. Doubt creeping into the effort creates distraction. It creates unnecessary conversation. You have to hold that belief that we can't achieve. So we've decided to build this model, Oregon being first. And thank you, Washington. I hope you can go first, but we have a path and we think we're gonna get there uh, very soon. Next slide. Hope at all times. Hope not just as a pipe dream, but hope for the possible. And because of the work being done, we know we can't achieve and that this is really not something uh, that's, um, Again, people call it a pipe dream or some crazy idea. We can really do this. Next slide. Persistence. We must persist at every stage. If you let go, that will, will roll back and crush us or put us way back. It might be one individual going forward. Uh, it might be a group of us pushing that ball. But as you can see in this image, we're getting closer to the top here in Oregon. And we think in other, country, other states as well. Next slide. Messaging. It is messaging that I think has helped us get there, trying to deliver the right message to the right audience at the right time, avoiding the one size fits all messaging process. But when we're talking about this, we wanna keep the messaging simple. Go ahead. Next slide. And if you could play that, Zainab. Uh, again, you have to share your sound. And Wes is on this call, and thank you, Wes, for being here and sharing yourselves with us and your story. Impactful messaging. That's what makes a difference at every stage of the game. I do this. Hello, my name is Wes Brain. I'm a board member of Healthcare for All Oregon. Why do I do this work? It's very personal for me. This is the most important thing in my life. I'm a volunteer, but I got a personal reason for it. I lost my daughter after nine years of struggle to get the care she needed when she needed it. Diagnosed in 2000 with leukemia, Tanya Ray for nine years went through things you hear about. I mean, getting the care she needed, get bankruptcy, being hounded by bill collectors, treating her like a dog in an alleyway. Brothers and sisters, nobody should ever be treated this way. You, 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 can, you can cut the, you can cut the video. Go ahead. I'm a member of Healthcare for because nobody's daughter. Okay, back, next slide. Okay, there's another, we're not gonna play this one. So, there's a simple message that's been both that describes the healthcare for all Oregon direction forward. And we'll put that link in the chat as to you can watch this little short video 
uh, from PHP Oregon. Next slide. Simple messaging. FAIR, FAIR is going on uh, very important. There's different kinds. We got this one from Martin Luther King. We use this one over and over again. Next slide. We got the QR code going. This is tells people in large crowds who we are and get involved. Add your name for justice. That's what the issue is. Tell people we're on the winning side. Very, very important because that boosts energy in the movement. And again, better care to more people for less money. Many of you have heard this one over and over again. Again, simple messaging out there to build supporters around the state. Next. Another ingredient is partnerships. We've, like Washington, uh, have built building many par partnerships among businesses, unions, faith groups, isn't listed on there, it was in my own slides, uh, community groups. The list of this is at our website, our business allies, our uh, member and endorsing organizations, our faith supporters. Uh, in addition, we're doing the work all the way down with provider groups, hospitals, and local governmental bodies through those resolutions that are uh, being passed. Next one. What is community engagement looks like? Community engagement looks like listening, not telling. That's what we've been doing. And that's what the task force is doing uh, with these sessions, listening out and not telling out necessarily. Uh, but hearing what people want about their healthcare system, what their struggles are. And that's what we need to continue to do as an organization to be successful, to engage a wider community. Let's hear from community so we build a plan that works for them. Next slide. Okay, so last is for me is this Joint Task Force on Universal Healthcare. What we did was we framed a set of purposes, values, and principles. There's only 14 items overall that, that frame the work that the task force has sworn to do. And, and the links for this also will be found in the chat. Next slide. So let's talk about the purpose. The task force on universal healthcare shall produce findings and recommendations for a well-functioning single payer healthcare financing system that is responsive to the needs and expectations of the residents of this state by doing these nine purposes that are gonna be listed again at our website, hco.org. Uh, under legislative, you can find what these purposes are and the values and the principles that we're, uh, that they're having to operate on. And remind you that the task force has to work in this framework. They're required by their sworn statement to do this work. And that's what's so exciting. Okay, and that's it for me to turn this over to, to Zainab. Chuck, I think you're unmuted if you're trying to say something. My my bad, of course. Um, yeah, next up is uh, Zainab Aladinita, uh, who's a board member for Healthcare for All Oregon and the Legislative Committee Chair. Uh, Zainab is a doctoral student in public health at Oregon State University and has an MPH from the University of North Carolina. She has extensive global uh, health experience and is a strong advocate for universal health care. Zainab, thank you. Thank you so much. All right, um, I will talk about the legislative pathway. I'm hoping this works because I do want to read my notes as we speak. Um, there we go. So um, Tom's um, talked about the path forward. Um, he showed you this picture. We still have quite a few steps to go still for to get to universal healthcare in Oregon. When you look at the steps on the screen, we're currently in the task force and community engagement stage. The task force needs to submit a report in September, and I'll go into the details of this report in a minute. But we also need to pass the Oregon Right to Healthcare Amendment in November, and the healthcare bill, bill begins. Uh, once the bill is written, it needs to pass at the legislature level, and then the governor signs it. After that, the bill starts to be implemented. So as you can see, we still have quite a ways to go, but we're very optimistic that Oregon can do it with the support of its residents and all the healthcare advocates that have put in countless hours and will be putting countless more in. So I'll start with the first step, the task force report. 
Task Force on Universal Healthcare was established in the 2019 legislative session. The task force is charged with producing findings and recommendations for a well-functioning single-payer healthcare financing system that is responsive to the needs and expectations of Oregon residents. So the task force began meeting in July of 2020 and submitted an interim status report to the legislature in June 2021. The task force was also granted an extension due to the delays caused by the pandemic. And so now the task force will submit their final recommendations for the Healthcare for All Oregon plan no later than September 2022, so a couple of months down the road. The task force is due, um, during these past two years has been working on different facets of making universal healthcare a reality in Oregon. It is conducted engagement with rural and underserved communities, as well as BIPOC communities. It's also engaged with a range of businesses based on industry and employee size. I want to note here that insurance companies have been kept out of the task force. Charlie will talk more about the challenges that the task force has faced and is facing as they work to get the report ready for September. Before I talk about what happens after the report is submitted in September, I wanna talk about the HOPE amendment, which is going on the ballot in November. So two months after the report is submitted. So the HOPE amendment, also known as the Oregon Right to Healthcare Amendment, is on the ballot in November of this year. Oregonians will be voting to support or oppose amending the state constitution. The amendment would add a section to the Oregon Constitution establishing a right to cost-effective, clinically appropriate, and affordable health care for every Oregon resident. The amendment would require the state to balance the obligations of ensuring the right to affordable health care against essential public services. If Oregonians vote yes to this amendment, then it would be the first amendment adopted by any state to secure the right to affordable health care for all state residents. This would be the first big win in the path to universal health care for Oregon. The ballot measure has significant support from various unions, including AFL-CIO. The ballot measure campaign is being overseen by SEIU and OIDE, the Oregon Nurses Association. We have high hopes for success in November, but also aware that there will be likely some opposition and campaigning from organizations whose profits depend on keeping this health care system broken. We're confident our efforts to pass this amendment will be successful though. And like I mentioned previously, the task force report will be submitted in September. The next, next step will be to write the healthcare bill based on the recommendations from the report. We currently have commitment from two legislative members, one from the House, one from the Senate, who are ready to do the pre-session filing. So this pre-session filing will technically happen before the report is out because a pre-session filing is due on the 23rd of September and the report comes out after that. This is going to give healthcare advocates the space to contribute to writing the bill. Also recommend from someone to take the report and draft the bill matching the contents of the report and the recommendations from the report. During this time, the public will also have an opportunity to weigh in with their input as they have in the whole process so far. And then once the healthcare bill is written, it will, go on the it will go on the floor for the next legislative session. This is where advocacy work is super important. Well, not just then, but just before it. We need to make sure that the bill has enough support when it comes time to vote. And to do that, healthcare advocates around the state will be working on getting members of the House and the Senate to vote yes. This is gonna be a very grassroots effort. ACAO is already tracking who is on the ballot this November and where they stand on this issue. We need to be prepared before the bill hits the floor. The opposing side, they have a lot of corporate profits backing them up. So this is where the hardest work will be done, making sure we have enough votes at the legislative level. Once it is passed, the legislative, once it passes the legislative level, the governor signs the bill and Oregon becomes the first state to implement a publicly funded healthcare system for its residents. Thank you. Terrific, Zainab, uh, really good. And uh, I love the, uh, the global map behind you. It's a great screensaver. Um, I, the, this theme here keeps repeating and I love it. Radical listening, learning and hope. This is really strong stuff. Uh, Charlie Swanson will be coming up next. And uh, 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 Charlie is a retired physicist uh, who taught at, at uh, high school, community college and university level. Uh, Charlie's president of Healthcare for All Oregon Action that's the uh, C4 arm of Healthcare for All Oregon, and is a member of One Pair of State's Policy Workgroup, 
and was a member of Oregon's Legislative Universal Access to Healthcare Workgroup. Charlie Swanson, welcome. Thanks, Chuck. Um, I will get my screen share going. Oops. Um, so we, we, people have already mentioned that state and national efforts are synergistic, so I won't really go into that anymore right now. Uh, the Oregon, as other states have found, that the state-based universal health care act, which we call Sabuca, would be very helpful. But I want to make sure people understand that it's not needed prior to passage of state bills, even if you think it's needed. Um, or want, think it could really help state bills, it, it doesn't really, it's not required to pass it before the state enacts something. In fact, passage of state bills that could be helped by Sabuca would create really good, strong pressure for its adoption. And uh, so we need to keep that in mind. Um, oops, so oh, somehow I, I went backwards, there we go. Um, we've also found in Oregon that state and national efforts are synergistic. Uh, we get better activist engagement when there's both state and national actions as possibilities. Uh, we're never sure what's going to happen sooner and uh, or which one is going to be have more action going on at the, at the current time. So we need to be prepared for either. And, and of course, we're all aware of Canada's province led path to its national system. Uh, and people have already mentioned that there's been a, a number of national improvements that have been started at the state level. Um, so there's a lot of challenges in, in technical challenges, especially in doing a state um, single payer system. Among those challenges is um, the necessary waivers um, to continue getting the federal funding. And of course, advocates and the task force, Oregon's task force have both recognized the use, usefulness of Sabuca in this and uh, both activists and the task force have been contacting the congressional delegation to um, Oregon's congressional delegation to pass or to become co-sponsors of Sabuca, so we're trying to move that forward. Um, but the task force is also doing some contingency planning. Um, in Barista, it can be a big challenge, but the task force heard from experts uh, Aaron Fuse brown Elizabeth McCuskey, who have outlined three features to try to make a bill um, as um, resistant to court ERISA challenges as possible, and they're pursuing, they're going to pursue all of those three features in the bill. Um, there's Medicare may be a challenge to get things, so they're pursuing other options. Uh, for example, a state becoming a Medicare Advantage insurer. Um, another thing that, that is, a, is a challenge is that expenditure protections are not simple. And um, as you know, you there, you need expert help with that. So task force has engaged the actual actuarial firm Optimist to do this. And uh, we've got knowledgeable activists, myself included, are checking everything that Optimist is doing. Um, additionally, we um, there is a legislative bill that was passed to require status quo estimates in Oregon. And that actually wasn't related to the single payer efforts. Um, but it, surprisingly, we don't even know how much is being spent currently in Oregon. And we're trying to get better um, estimates of that. Um, the task force is engaging William Chow to help with single payer saving estimates. Um, there's, oops, ooh, um, let me go back here. Um, and there's, there are another thing that's come up is that Oregon and probably most states vastly underpay behavioral health and mental health care providers. And so we're, we've got some task force members with expertise in this that are trying to ensure that when we move to a single payer system that we increase um, provider reimbursements to various, to, 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 in some areas, and especially with behavioral and mental health. Um, there's, there are challenges with creating a task force structure to transfer all of the private funding to the public funding. Um, the task force is engaging with the Legislative Revenue Office for expertise, and it's also, as has been mentioned quite a bit, engaging with the public to get feedback on what would the public support. Um, so there's opportunities also come up. Um, 
one of the things that has been mentioned is regional cooperation. Uh, we, we, we need to learn and support from others. Um, so we've got some legislators in Oregon who are really committed to regional cooperation. And uh, I want to mention especially Senator James Manning, who is the legislative champion of the bill that created the task force, and also the chair of our Senate Health Care Committee, Senator Deb Patterson. And they're both really committed to regional cooperation. Um, and so we're going to be encouraging that. Um, I would say that among the regional cooperations that are very important and could be done actually independently of single payer efforts would be multi-state efforts at public purchasing of uh, prescription drugs and equipment. Um, another important kind of cooperation that can happen and I think will be happening is um, timing and details of state single payer efforts so that when you go to the ballot in Washington, we're also going to the ballot in Oregon and they're also going to the ballot in California or something of that nature. So that sort of cooperation can be very useful. Um, another thing that is can be very useful is um, after states get single payer plans, if they're all independent, even if they're independently set up, they can get they can make reciprocal care agreements between those states so that people can flow easily from one state to another and not have to worry about it. Um, so um, another opportunity that comes up is in efforts against single payer. So for example, ERISA lawsuits or efforts against state-based universal health care act. So against state efforts, um, these can actually lead to greater recognition of the importance of national improved Medicare for all. Um, you know, imagine the activated population. If, if a number of states have passed good single payer bills and um, people are challenging them, there's risk of challenges and it looks like it's going, it's like, okay, well, there's a couple options Congress could have. They could, they could pass the BUCA or they could do the better thing. They could pass national improved Medicare for all. So, so we think there's lots of synergistic possibilities and I'll leave it at that. Actually, there's one more slide. I think um, I'll just put that back up again. <laughs> Thanks. Ter terrific, Charlie. Excellent um, uh, presentation from the Oregon team, uh, Tom. Uh, Zainab and, and, and Charlie. And uh, at this time, let's um, pivot to uh, some questions that I pulled. And Mike, you may have done so as well from the chat. Um, but, but I do want to uh, just reinforce what's being said by both the Washington team and the Oregon team. And that is, is that, and this is to me, the, maybe the most exciting moment that I've experienced in almost 50 years of organizing and about uh, 15 years in this organizing space with one with uh, one pair of states and national health care for all is, uh, is is developing a grand strategy and a grand strategy that will encompass a coordination of state national and regional efforts and will comprehend all the various parallel uh, efforts that we need to make in terms of outreach communications uh, policy development um, engagement with with communities that of color uh, in other places in, in faith and business, a lot of stuff that's already been talked about today. So with that in mind, I just want to is elevate this discussion to turn to some questions that we got in the chat. And uh, Wes Brain uh, dropped in a few questions. So there was one asked about why isn't California here? I don't know if that came from Wes or Jonathan, or I just picked that up. But the reason that, that you should know that Washington and Oregon are here is because they're actually approaching very concrete uh, 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 goals uh, and, and appear to be as close as any in the nation to actually getting to universal health care. So the, this is a determination we made with the folks over at Healthcare for Now who wanted to hear from the states. And I would also just like to thank Ben Day and Jillian Mason for those conversations and for inviting us into this room for this opportunity. We all wanna see California cross the finish line, absolutely. I mean, for somebody who used to live there for eight years, went to high school and college, but that's why the Washington and Oregon folks are here today. Um, so Wes all, did ask this question, could you please speak to the synergy uh, of what's happening on the West Coast? Uh, and that does include, of course, California, potentially Nevada, and our friends over in Colorado reaching into the Rockies. Um, uh, as well, maybe pick up the thread of the, the cross-border authorities working, the cr cross-border authority in engaging with labor unions, especially workers who 
who are, live in one state and uh, reside in another. Can uh, any, any of our six panel members pick up those questions about sort of the, the regional issues, the synergy, uh, which was spoken to today, but does anybody want to add anything to that? Can, Tom? Yeah, I can speak to that because I was just at the AFL-CIO convention here or in Oregon, where all the unions and this issue came up, uh, you know, which was uh, good news is that the all these unions unanimously said yes to the HOPE Amendment, access to care is a fundamental right. But when it got to the little question out there of what about publicly funded and this issue of cross states and all that. So we have uh, have a plan uh, to uh, engage and have those discussions with those unions right now. And the uh, task force will also, uh, hopefully as we set this going forward, we'll be able to hear from these trust fund unions. Uh, so it's high in our minds to have these discussions and talk about this uh, issue. Our plan for Oregon is to make sure that everybody is covered properly. The task force is aware of this issue and we're, but in the listening phase, we're going to want to try to get those unions in front of the task force so the task force can hear what they've got to say. Mm -hmm. Terrific, Tom. Uh, any other panelists want to respond? Okay. Um, I, I, I will add that there, we're in the planning stages at this point, uh, bringing together at the national level uh, unions uh, representation to speak to uh, the effort to need to coordinate here again at the state, regional, and national level. Ta thanks so much, Tom, for that update. Uh, there's another question in, in the box that came from, I think a couple questions from Jonathan Ross. Um, uh, one by way of suggesting for comment that Washington might uh, create an all-payer system similar to what Maryland did for their hospitals. Is that something that's being contemplated in either Washington or in Oregon, an all-payer system? I think that more broadly, we're talking about what what is the stepwise approach with um, different ways of handling things financially. For, there's many different things you could do. You could say, well, maybe we're trying to get managed care out of Medicaid, or maybe we're trying to put the exchange on Medicaid as a first step. So that and that's another first step that could be taken. So. I don't I wouldn't say we have that all mapped out, but definitely those are the kind of discussions we're having. Does that help? Sure. That's uh, Kelly Powers from Washington. Any uh, uh, um, Oregon? Yeah, a little uh, bit. Um, so Oregon did look at uh, they, they had a separate task force um, that that looked at the um, all payer system in Maryland and the in essence, they decided that it wasn't going to be very helpful. And certainly we, um, in pushing the um, universal task force, universal healthcare task force did not want that to be something. We, we decided we did not want to look at intermediate steps. Um, some of the task force members themselves do seem to want to, but we've been pushing for, well, that's not what you're gonna do first. You know, if you have plenty of time, which they don't, they're, you know, you gotta look at what you really need to do. So I'll say that. Okay, terrific, Charlie, appreciate that. Um, there's another uh, comment in the chat here from Alan Myers, uh, looks like from Massachusetts. Um, and, 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 and we can take this as a more general commentary about our discussion about framing and the use of words and obviously, you know, the Affordable Care Act, uh, he's making reference here to the use of the word affordable, that a lot of our language has become politicized, right? And we have to use language that's perhaps fresh and says the same thing without, without creating a reaction, you know, because th th this is something that we study a lot at healthcare at, at, at uh, one pair of states, which is, is communication strategies. Uh, most people operate out of the political brain, the political brain. People are tribal in the way that they think and act. Most people are not, in fact, rational about a lot of these discussions. So does anybody want to jump in on the general question of communications and the need to do, to do framing uh, uh, effectively? I hope I didn't steal your thunder. <laughs> I can speak to that, especially huh. the word affordable that came in. And that's where the listening goes in. When we say, what's affordable to you? Not what's affordable in this historical, the same thing comes up with affordable housing, which we know isn't. 
especially in Portland, Oregon, and many other uh, cities. So the issue is going back, and when people are telling us then, we can turn it around and say, no cost at the point of service, right? When I don't have to worry about what I'm paying at any given point when I'm seeking health care, right? And probably shifting some of that to um, not worrying about bankruptcy. And again, it will depend on the audience that we're speaking to uh, as we go forward. Uh, the right message, the right group at the right time. And maybe the word affordable isn't always the one, but in order to get something through, like in this HOPE Amendment, the word affordable was put up there, but it's really what's affordable to the most marginalized communities. And that's what we're gonna be uh, aiming for here in Oregon. But I think you're right about watching that framing. Thank you. Terrific, Tom. Yeah, thanks so much. I think I, I'm, I'm not seeing other questions. If folks wanna raise their hands, you're welcome to do that. But in the meantime, I, I'd like to pivot over to Bevan who has been taking the lead in starting up these conversations among and between activists, legislators, uh, in California, Oregon, and Washington. Uh, really exciting developments and something that, that as President One Pair says, I wanna carry this forward to the New England states and any other cluster of states that wanna get these conversations going, these cross-border conversations. Bevan, can you share what's your liberty to share? Sure, yeah. I mean, I will just say that uh, for years, you know, I've, I've heard people talking about, talking about reaching out to talk about doing the things. <laughs> And so finally, uh, at, at AHW, we thought, well, you know what, let's just reach out to some folks, uh, some legislators in Oregon and California and see if there's an appetite to start having some meetings around what a regional system could look like, you know, um, and maybe starting with, uh, you know, some drug, drug purchasing or whatever. So we've had two meetings so far, and I think there seems to be certainly appetite for that. And, and I know that that Tom and Charlie, we've we've chatted too. And I think as we sit down to build out those conversations a little bit more, we'll, we'll kind of to the question about labor and, you know, community involvement. I think once there's actually something to kind of chew on and put forward for folks, we'll, we'll start doing that outreach and, and um, getting labor to the table, because that's key. But I see there being significant appetite in all three states. So it's exciting. Terrific, Bevan. Yeah, let's- can I, can I add that quickly? Thank you, Bevan, for doing that. Um, point of awareness for Oregon, we've got a lot of work going into who's gonna be in the legislature coming up because our, even on our healthcare committee, I believe there's on the House side, there's only gonna be one remaining member of our House healthcare committee going into the next session. So who those will be involved in those conversations? Well, clearly the appetite is there, but who those players might be is going to change. And we can talk about that going forward. Right. And, and I would like to add um, that my expectation is that Hawaii could be very interested in joining with this as well, and maybe some other states, but I think we, we definitely need to reach out to people in Hawaii, so. Terrific, thanks, Charlie. Uh, other folks? in the mix here. Um, I'd also like to, to uh, give a quick shout out as we did to, at the end of our plenary to our dear friend, David Loud, who has been instrumental in, in, in pulling uh, the Washington folks together for this presentation. Just wanted to say thank you for your great work, David. It's a, a great compliment to be working with you. Um, do other folks have questions? Any hands? You can just, uh, Chris Curry. Yeah. Yeah, I have a question for Kelly. Uh, could you just explain who is on our commission and how did they get there? You're muted, Kelly. Kelly, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like me earlier, you're, yeah. Chris, you can do it. Go ahead, take it away. Well, <laughs> I think it was, uh, we recommended uh, certain people to the governor and five of our recommendations were actually chosen by the governor's office to be on that, that commission. So that was a, a, a huge amount of organizing and, and, and uh, recommending that paid off really well. And so we, we have very um, interested, very knowledgeable and very supportive people on our commission that they're certainly not there to undermine the, the project. 
Terrific, Chris. Thank you so much. And and I I I, I would I'd like to call up uh, uh, Phil Kim if I could. Now I don't know if this is a if, if this is a question that puts yeah. Well, in any case, one of the questions that keeps is 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 creating a lot of confusion, right? Is the role of the HHS secretary, uh, Javier Becerra, mm -hmm. and and the question of is the or is the general statement about state innovation that 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 exists in the Affordable Care Act, uh, uh, Section 1332, as well as some others, is that adequate? Is that sufficient to acquire the necessary waivers for states to move forward with the funding and 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 ERISA? Do you have a handle on that? I know that previously we had your 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 cohort with us, uh, but do you have a, a read on that for us, Kim or Phil? Yeah, I'm happy to uh, give our position on it. And it's similar to what I can't remember who somebody mentioned, but our position is that uh, there's an existing uh, wave coordinated waivers process that you just mentioned, and that allows states to um, to create a single payer system. Um, and, and we do support the the common bill, uh, but we, we don't think it's necessary to go ahead and start passing single payer bills and start creating single payer systems, it would make it more more easy, I guess. Uh, but we think there's a coordinated process, uh, system of waivers um, in the ACA that we can take advantage of. And I just shared a, um, a fact sheet if you wanna look at this um, fact sheet we put together that uh, refers to different parts of, um, of different laws, federal laws. Okay, thanks. Thanks for the clarification, Phil. Appreciate that. Um, it's, it is an important conversation that we have here. Um, it, it, we're right at the top of the hour here. I want to be respectful of everybody's time to pivot over to the next workshop. Uh, I want to, again, uh, thank all of our, our participants uh, from Oregon and Washington. Uh, we'll be doing this twice uh, uh, more tomorrow uh, during the, the workshop sessions. And, and if you would, please, if you can come back, great. And please invite other people who might be interested in, in these workshops uh, to, to join us tomorrow. Uh, these are East Coast times at either one o'clock or 2.30, and you can do the math backwards. Uh, the West Coast, of course, is 10 and 11.30 tomorrow uh, for repeat of these workshops. And thank you for uh, tech assistance uh, uh, from from the, the the great folks uh, who are working with us on this uh, on this project, and Mike Huntington, thank you for your engineering work. So for everyone, have a great uh, rest of your today and and uh, next workshop around. Uh, thank you so much. Thanks. Bravo.